at any convening that we have at Big Picture, and those of you that have been with us for some time know that we always believe in finishing strong at our convenings. Um, it's important, as we heard from Talik, we start off with stories. We know our students well. We know each other well. Um, but finishing strong with students is also equally as important. Um, and as we know, the work that we've, we're all engaged in as principals and school leaders requires a heavy dose of leading with hearts and minds. Um, and yesterday, we, we, you know, we tried to ensure that we nourished our, our, our souls and our bodies. And today, we're going we're gonna to push our minds a little bit um, and allow that to really carry us through the end of this calendar year, the end of this long leg of the start of the school year, and into ideally and hopefully a really joyous holiday season. Um, I'm super excited to be able to be here and have this conversation with folks that I call friends in the work. Um, I had the pleasure of working along with Nancy and Arthur and all the MET principals and supporting them, and then later on, formerly with Big Picture and working with school leaders in New York City, shout out to my home city, um, and Newark, New Jersey, and throughout New Jersey, um, and supporting them in their work is school, in schools. And one of the things that I clearly learned is that the, the, the better I was in my work to, in supporting them, the better they were in their work, in supporting their staff and supporting students, all things that we know. But that also often meant the ability to support them in their, not just professional goals, but in their personal and life goals. And sometimes that also meant getting the hell out of their way and allowing you to do the work that you do. So, which is one of the primary reasons why we've designated this talk as real talk with system level leaders. Now, uh, I'll just share up front that uh, when we reached out to our colleagues here and asked them if they would join us. We asked them if they were okay with this being videotaped. And all of them said yes, because they knew that, A, in addition to the questions that we will be respectfully peppering them with, we know that you all will have an opportunity to throw questions at them as well. Again, and they know that they're in a friendly environment. <laughs> <laughs> Right, y'all, right? Friendly environment? Yeah. Yes. And, and any, any questions that come up are, are purposeful and with intent to better understand so that we get better at our work in supporting our schools and our students. Amen? Amen. No doubt, no doubt. All right, so before, uh, before I introduce our, co we, we introduce our colleagues, I um, want to encourage folks that are on Twitter to utilize the uh, big picture, the, the conference hashtag, which is hashtag BPL leadership, and help us amplify some of the gems that are going to be dropped here by our panelists. So it's just hashtag BP leadership. Um, we, we want this conversation and what's going to be shared here to be amplified beyond the 175 people that are here. So if you are on Twitter, anything that you hear that you're feeling that makes tons of sense and you want to get out, please do so. In addition, please, as I mentioned uh, briefly, just think about the questions that you have um, as you're hearing our, our, our friends kind of share their, their responses to some of these questions, some of their thoughts. Okay. With that, let's introduce our, our, our panelists, Ms. Eunice. Oh, I think I'm up. Sorry. My bad. It's okay. This is rolling. This is real. Um, it's real talk. So first, I have the pleasure of introducing Ms. Bobby McDonald. Bobby serves as the founding executive director of the City Neighbors Foundation and Charter Network. City Neighbors operates the City Neighbors Network of Schools in Baltimore City and is dedicated to the transformation of public education in Baltimore. In this role, Bobby is responsible for maintaining a strong stance on vision the vision of the school and where every student is known, loved, and inspired. I have the pleasure of giving Bobby some love. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Joseph Davis of Ferguson Fluorescent School District. Uh, Dr. J Davis began serving the 
Ferguson Florissant School District as a superintendent in 2015. Prior to that, he served as a superintendent of Washington County Schools in North Carolina and deputy chief of schools in Chicago Public Schools. Dr. Davis has over 24 years of experience in education, starting as a bus driver before teaching middle school and high school mathematics and serving as assistant principal and principal at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Dr. Davis also serves as an adjunct professor at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Davis and his family live in Ferguson. Welcome. Also with us, we have a uh, friend and fellow basketball warrior, uh, <laughs> James Nyhoff, who is the superintendent of Shelby County School District in Shelbyville, Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Nyhoff is in his 10th year as superintendent of Shelby and in his 26th year as a public school educator in Kentucky. His teaching career focused on technology education and included the design and creation of innovative high school technology labs at two high schools. Along the way to his current role, he also served as a high school assistant principal and as a district director of student services. In 2013, Dr. Nyhoff led a strategic planning in initiative to create a strategic roadmap towards personalization of education in the district. Now in his fourth year, the 2014 strategic plan paved the way for the addition of a Big Picture Learning Academy in the fall of 2016, the district's first choice school. Dr. Nyhoff is married to Dorenda, and they have one son. Last but certainly not least, we have Roberto Padilla, New, uh, Newburgh Enlarged School District. Um, so Robert is the superintendent of Newburgh Enlarged School District in Newburgh, New York. From humble beginnings as a child, Robert, Roberto learned early on in his life the true meaning of resilience and grit. He is a lifelong educator, having been a teacher, assistant principal, principal, coach, and leadership consultant. Even today, he considers himself a teacher who, is, who just happens to be a superintendent. He also considers himself to be an equity warrior whose purpose is to give all children a fighting chance in having a productive life. Roberto is married and has three wonderful children. So in true big picture fashion, we want to start this conversation, this real talk, um, with a question that helps us understand who you are and my advisory knows my advisory here knows that we'd love to hear the uncanned version. So um, if you would, please tell us a little bit about your, your individual stories and what brought you to this work and what keeps you in this work. And we're going to start with, with Joe, Dr. Davis. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. So um, I'll dive right in. Um, and this is the uncanned version. So. Um, so my mother was 17 when she had me. Uh, my mother and my grandmother were my parents. And these black women in the South were simply amazing, right? Like they, you know, I didn't have my father in my life. And so the statistics were there, right? Um, you know, and not supposed to be successful, but I had two strong women uh, who uh, were amazing. Uh, my grandmother was uh, just the sort of the matriarch of the family and she's been gone now for 20 years to be with the Lord. Um, but they taught me some things that, to this day, I, that they go with me every day uh, with the work that I do. Um, and, you know, my undergrad is in computer science, so I was going to program and do what everybody else <laughs> told me I needed to be doing. Uh, but I had a great teacher in high school uh, who taught me trig and calculus like nobody else. And I became a math teacher because of her. This little white lady that probably weighed 100 pounds wit. And it didn't matter that I was a little black boy who was poor, but what she saw was my potential, and she taught that, and that made all the difference in the world, coupled with the values and, and the morals that those other two black women taught me. And I say race, and I use race intentionally because it's purposeful, uh, because when we look at that children, we have to educate the potential and not their present situation. Um, and so they gave me something that I you know, use today, and uh, that is uh, love. Uh, I try to love people as Harper does uh, at her school, um, you know, deeply, because that makes all the difference in the world. 
Um, you know, uh, just a quick story about me, and, 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 and some of you may know some of this. Uh, so I was arrested back in August of this year after Big Picture uh, this summer, and uh, I was arrested on August 16th. Um, my son and I were going to a nice dinner with a couple of folks in the community, and you know, so I'm all, all about building relationships. Um, and so my son's 12, uh, going on 20. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got pulled over and uh, was, you know, thinking maybe I, you know, ran a light. It was raining outside, so I know it wasn't speeding. And the guy comes over to me and says, you know, are you uh, Joseph Davis? And I said, wow, never had someone to come to me and stop me for a traffic violation and know my name. Mm. So I'm like, wow, what's, you know, what's going on? And so he said, could you step out of the car? And I said, well, what did I do? I had my hand on the steering wheel. I, you know, I did the driving while black thing. Right. I made sure that, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, was, uh, I came correct, right? And so, um, you know, I, I said, I want to know what I did. You know, I think I have that right, don't I? Um, and so I didn't get indignant or anything because my son was there. Um, and so I want to be an example. <laughs> um, and so I stepped out of the car. And then he walks me to the back of the car and says, you know, uh, we have a warrant for your arrest. And I'm looking around for the cameras like, you know, it's got to be like, this is punked. Right, I've got to right. be, I'm getting ready to get punked for some reason. I don't know what, what's going on. And, and, and literally, I got arrested because of uh, some work that, that we did when I was in Washington County, North Carolina. And, and, and let me say this disclaimer. There are some amazing people in my former district, Washington County in North Carolina. I got arrested uh, on the 16th of August. I was in jail for three days, two nights for $139.58. Uh, let me tell you briefly what happened, uh, not to get too deeply, um, but, you know, when I was superintendent there, um, I did all the work that I do now for the district. Their American Express card was tied to my Priceline account. And, um, you know, I didn't, and that was two years ago now. And so I made a, a, a reservation for a trip to go to do a keynote for someone uh, that they paid me to do it. I go in my Priceline account uh, thinking I'm clicking on my American Express card and clicked on theirs, not knowing it was still there. Charged a car in a hotel. The total was $139.58. Two different transactions. Charged their car, thinking I was charging mine. This happened in January. Mm. It was August after I got arrested that I realized that it, even, it happened. I paid my card off every month, so I didn't, you know, do any reconciling knowing it wasn't there because it was such a, you know, nominal fee. It wasn't a whole lot. Fast forward, I find out that some people who were upset with me there, uh, when, when it happened, didn't call me and say, you know, this happened. Could you just, you know, pay the money? In fact, I gave my attorney the money immediately. Long story short, um, got arrested. And what I realized is that some people were really upset, and probably still are, because of some of the work that we do for kids. And, and, he, and here's what I think happened. I got asked this to the media, but I didn't say it, so this is the uncanned version. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I remember uh, a couple of conversations I had with county commissioners. So the district I left, uh, money's come to districts, you know, local, state, federal. Uh, that local district was given about 10% of the funds to our district. 10% of our uh, uh, budget came from local. The state average was about 26%. My district in Ferguson gives about 55% local to uh, our district. So I, I brought that out pretty clearly and pretty consistently in the community, really pushing county commissioners to fund education a whole lot better than what they were doing. Because these black kids that, uh, because they were like 98% of the kids were black uh, from, from poor communities like the one I, I grew up in, and we're not funding education. And it was just a travesty, and I think it probably still is. Uh, because we have to be equity warriors for all kids. And when you have a voice and you really are passionate about doing the right thing for children, it doesn't matter in the face of whom it may be, you got to do the right thing for children. And so you make people upset. And so I got some people so upset that, you know, I landed myself in jail. <laughs> but I got out. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, and, and, and still doing the work for children because I believe in what we do. My son is one of our students. I absolutely believe in what we do. And so that's some of what brought me to this work, uh, in addition to uh, those two black women and that one white woman who cared about me and wanted me to be educated well. So, you yeah. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, I am from the south side of Chicago, and um, one of my earliest memories is sitting on my ma's lap at an impeached Nixon party. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, in my family, you know, you were taught that when something's not right, you do something about it. Um, my family stayed in Chicago on that South Side neighborhood for a long time until the schools got a little too violent. And um, though my ma tried to organize and say, let's all have this change that's happening, you know, the desegregation of schools and the change of the neighborhood slow, it, she didn't succeed at that. And, um, and so we were part of that white flight into the South suburbs. 
the school that um, we went to, they moved to a, a district that had great schools, you know, purposefully. Um, there's five kids in my family. I'm the youngest. They're all salesmen and educators, so I come by it honestly. Um, when we walked into that um, school in the suburbs, there were kids, you know, laying on their tummies in the, in the hallway with math books propped open. There were kids acting. There were, like, it was just all this vibrant thing happening in the hallways. And I remember, you know, holding my mom's hand and saying, man, those guys are going to be in trouble, you know, because the school I'd come from in Chicago was about um, compliance. You know, the hallways is where you walk straight and you don't talk. And reading time was a, a reading circle with Sally, Dick, and Jane books, you know, and, and everyone in the circle got to read one word. And I always got and or the. <laughs> you know? Oh, I wanted to say Sally's name, you know. Um, so we walked into that school and the contrast, you know, even though I was a little kid, the contrast was so strong, you know, made a big impression on me. And um, so I uh, grew up and, um, and got into uh, early childhood education and really loved it and um, loved being on the ground with the kids and meeting them where they're at in that developmental model. And I worked for um, different schools, you know, I worked in Head Start. I worked in a wealthy cooperative. I worked in a um, hospital daycare. I had these different experiences that contributed to my understanding of what makes a great school. And then um, my husband and I moved to uh, Baltimore and had our own kids. And when my daughter Sadie was old enough, I walked to the public school near my house. And there it was, you know, kids walking silently in lines down that same hallway and teachers holding scripts. You know, everyone looks scared. <laughs> You know, and uh, I really couldn't believe it. And, um, and I understood that the school was filled with good people, but the design was wrong, you know? And I went home that night and, and said to my husband, you know, this is crazy. Are, are we gonna move out of the city too? You know, and when, when does that stop? Like, why can't the public schools be awesome for every child in the city, you know? And that was the night Maryland passed the charter school law. You know, it was on the news. And I didn't even know what a charter school was, you know, but my a friend called, you know, like kind of the call to action. The phone actually rang, you know, and um, said, hey, I'm watching the news, you know, and Maryland passed a charter school law. And when I woke up the next morning, I thought, man, this is going to be great. <laughs> you know, we could create a school, the best school you could imagine, you know, and make the work of that school for the people in it to do that imagining. And, um, and that started a journey, you know, which led to two more schools and 850 kids and working with amazing, amazing leaders and teachers. And um, that was 15 years ago. So it, it took a little while and effort, but, um, but now there's, there's, um, there are schools and movements in Baltimore City that are integrated and that are seeing children as powerful and capable and worthy of the deepest respect, no matter what their background, you know? And for me personally, to be part of that effort and to, and to um, you know, make that part of my life and, and grow up within that has made a big difference for me personally and, and, um, and hopefully for Baltimore too. So that's a little bit of my story. Awesome. Right, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I was so inspired by my teachers that I was drawn to education. Right, it's supposed to be uncanned, right? Right. Uh, all right, so uh, I guess the short version, the uncanned version would be that uh, fear and addiction helped me to be a superintendent. So from the earliest memories of my life, uh, all I could think of is fear. So at five years old, hearing a knock, an odd knock at the door and going to open it and seeing this uh, professionally dressed uh, female with a briefcase, I immediately knew something was wrong. And sure enough, 10 minutes later, my siblings and I were being ushered out of our apartment into foster care. When I got out of foster care, uh, more memories of fear. So I, I remember uh, the older guys in the neighborhood uh, selling drugs, playing CeeLo on the corners, lots of fighting. Yeah, I, I did a lot of fighting. Uh, and right around in 10th grade, I had two very close friends who were murdered within three months of each other. And it was the very first time in my life that I went to school with a new purpose. 
And I feared that if I didn't do something with myself, if I didn't attend school with a new purpose, that perhaps I could have ended up just like them. And so what oddly happened at that point, it was the first time I really started to apply myself in school, and I started to see a different reaction from, um, from the faculty and staff. It was the very first time I was even, I had success academically. And so that's where the addiction really kicked in because the minute I experienced that success, I wanted more. And so, you know, I achieved high honor roll, went off to college, studied abroad, and then said, oh, well, what if I uh, pursued a doctorate? And so did that. And I can say, you know, and I don't feel bad for saying, I know oftentimes people think of addiction as something bad, but in this case, I think it's actually something that had saved my life. Uh, wanting to be successful has propelled me to want to do more for others. And so I'm sitting on this stage today because I'm filled with a high. Uh, this morning I learned that one of our teachers won National CTE uh, Teacher of the Year. And so that's a, that's a huge honor. Two years ago, we had the uh, New York State Teacher of the Year, uh, another great success. And so, you know, I find great joy in other people's successes. So whether it's my own personally or those of our kids uh, or adults in our district, it's it what drives me. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, James. It's a, first of all, I just want to say it's a real honor and a, and a pleasure to be a part of this, um, this experience and to be with this panel. Uh, thank, thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Um, I, I started uh, in public education after uh, being convinced that, that I didn't want to be a teacher. My parents were teachers, and so I, I started that, that journey at 20, uh, 28 years old after uh, realizing I couldn't resist it any longer. Uh, and um, so the years have kind of flown by. I, I didn't ever intend to be a superintendent. I did dream of being a high school principal. And, uh, and that, was, that was the path I was, I was pursuing. And um, uh, one opportunity came after, a, after another, and, uh, and I ended up in the superintendent role. And one of, one of the things that... that uh, gave me this opportunity to be a superintendent 10 years ago uh, was that our, our superintendent left and, uh, and we had an interim superintendent and we were in a situation where uh, we were changing the transportation system throughout the district and I, and I was in charge of that as a director of, of student services. And uh, school had started, we had an interim superintendent and, and the first day, of, day or two of school didn't go very well. Buses were late, uh, people were angry, it, it was uh, one, of those, one of those yucky times. And I remember uh, we convened the, the whole administrative team, principals and all, and I'd been operating on about two or three hours of sleep for about three nights in and out of the bus garage trying to, trying to work through this whole thing. And, uh, and I remember saying to them, uh, people won't remember what you said, but they're going to remember how you say it and how you treat them. And uh, the interesting thing to me, I went home that day and I told my wife, what we're doing now is either going to kill my career or it's going to kick off my career. And uh, still yet today, 10 years later, I have people throughout the community who come back and repeat to me um, that those words that, that I said when I was exhausted, kind of at the end of my rope in a tough spot. And uh, I w had enough sense to focus on uh, how we treat people not what we say. And um, I think that's probably if there's a message I want to say about um, my leadership and my work thus far that I want to leave with you is that um, I still work on that premise. It's, um, it's, kind of, it's kind of tough sometimes to be in the role, as I was hearing about uh, what, what Joe, Joe told the story. Well, I, you know, that's our worst nightmare, that in the intent of doing the right thing, somehow you leave some little thing undone and someone capitalizes on it and, and causes pain and causes hurt. Uh, but in a, in, a, in a bigger sense, the work we're about is so much bigger than that, that 
then I think it's worth it. Um, so I, I would say this, to come to this world of competency-based education, for me, the school district was in, uh, in the bottom third when I started as superintendent in, in academic scores, and we moved up into the, into the top 25% in state testing. And I was thrilled with that, but I also realized uh, we were never going to open the doors for kids in gaps because as we did that, our gaps stayed the same all those years. And so when we committed to the strategic plan four years ago, structured on competency-based education, it was really about, in my mind, opening doors for students uh, who were perpetually in those gaps across our district. But what it's, it has evolved to, as I've learned uh, various things, has been that, um, that competency-based education, uh, competency-based education is about our students being assessed in ways that are so different from those bubble end tests and, uh, and a commitment to that. So we've, I, I hope to get a chance to share with, more with you later about where we are in the state of Kentucky moving towards competency-based education. But uh, I've just been in the right place at the right time to be a part of leading that work. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Thank you, thank you for sharing those stories. Um, we're gonna jump right into what Carlos uh, hinted to, and Bobby, I'm gonna ask you to start us off with your reaction to this question. So our conference was, um, the theme of our conference is leading with mind, body, and soul. And as an organization, we are committed and, and intentional about thinking about the whole, the whole child, the whole teacher, the whole principal. So, um, so the question for the, for the panel, and starting with Bobby, is what does it mean to you and how do you support your leaders and their staff in ensuring a healthy life-work balance? Okay. Um, so I think um, at City Neighbors, that's the name of our schools in Baltimore, um, we really do have a stand for, obviously, for seeing the whole child. But at, at every level, and starting with myself, um, you know, who you're becoming is what you bring to the work. And so being self-reflective, taking the time to, um, to see how your alignment is in terms of the work that you're doing and being humane in the face of the work we're doing is really important as a leader because then your school will also have that alignment. So I'm saying that important for us to take care of ourselves in that way because we're leading an organization, and then really can, that organization can take a stand as well, especially in public education when there's been this overemphasis on you know, testing and a narrowing of what it really means to get an education. And I think it's taken some courage from everyone at every level to say, we're defining it more broadly than that because we want the same thing for our children that we're teaching that we want for ourselves. You know, to be able to live a meaningful, purposeful life, you have to be able to know what that means to you. Um, and so, you know, we're really joyful. We play a lot at City Neighbors, you know. We play um, in our kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade, you know. Um, by the way, Danique Dali is here, uh, was a past principal um, of the Met School, and he is our founding principal of our high school Danique. in Baltimore. So, <laughs> And um, I thought of him right then because Danique was the most playful principal I've ever known at Halloween. I'm just telling you, this man every year had the best costume. Um, but also really a joyful, loving community. And I think that um, another part of it is, you know, we eat well together. There's a lot of food happening in our schools, you know. And um, our high school has um, 24 kitchen areas, actually, you know, and 38 living rooms. It's, it's like, how do you create a whole culture of people who are growing together? And so the way we support each other in that is, you know, there's challenges that come with making that commitment. You know, it's different, and you're redefining it, and the kids have to build that internal control that we start, you know, with the youngest kids and push all the way up through 12th grade. But we support each other in, um, in staying true to that because the default culture is so strong. You know, it's always pulling you back. And so, um, so as a leadership team, you know, we have direct supports for our principals. 
Um, I have an amazing colleague, Mike Chalupa, who's the academic director of City Neighbors, who is a mentor to those three principals. Um, we, we're trying to help each other like in the sy systemic way of what structures, how do we create the structures and systems so that our organization feels that way, but also in the most personal way, what's happening in your life. So, I, and I know this is a big picture learning thing too, it's about relationships. And it's about taking a stand for those relationships to really matter in your organization and for everything, including the physical environment, to show that that is important. Thank you. So in the spirit of real talk, uh, I think this is an area we're failing. And not just in Newburgh, I think across the country, districts and schools are sadly failing at this work-life balance. And so what is that? You know, I'd really like to know what that is because it's something that I struggle with. I know it's something my colleagues struggle with. Uh, and so when I started to think about this, so why do we struggle? And I think it has a lot to do, I just want to give a quick shout out to Melissa and Ebony from NFA West. Uh, my people over there. Uh, so we were quickly chatting earlier about this work-life balance, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that I think we're just programmed to consistently put other people first. And so the notion of taking care of yourself means you're being a little selfish. And when you think of just the concept of selfishness, there's a negative connotation to that, right? And so when someone's being accused of being selfish, it's not for something good, right? Uh, but I think this is one of those times when you actually have to be selfish and you have to give yourself the liberty to, to be selfish and feel okay and not beat yourself up about it. And so if that means that you, uh, I, I constantly encourage people to get massages, uh, right? Pamper yourself, do something nice for yourself. I know based on uh, Twitter stories that have been taking place this week, you guys were meditating, you were doing yoga, you were getting massages, you were playing basketball. And that has to be built into your, your weekly routine. And, and it's normally not because you're putting other people first and with good, good cause. But if you're not selfish in this case, right, we know the stories, right, and we think it's not going to happen to us, right? So we know people burn out. We certainly know a number of superintendents who have burnt out and are no longer with us because they didn't take care of themselves. And so if I could just offer, again, I'll put it out front, I'm not, I'm not great at this, we're trying things, right? And I'm hoping as a result of trying some new things that it, it really picks up momentum in our district. So, uh, so little things like we have a snack box in my conference room because of how late people work. And so when I first came on board, the snack box was filled with Snickers and M&M peanuts, and yeah, that all tastes great. But if you, that snack box is constantly filled with potato chips and, and in our refrigerator we have soda, well, that's, that's what people are gonna have access to, and that obviously isn't gonna help their diet. So I quickly transformed the snack box and put baked potato chips and 100% fruit juices in the refrigerator and different healthier granola bars. And yeah, people gave me a hard time about it and they made comments like, you know, we're not rabbits and we like the chocolate, we need, we need the chocolate to keep us, you know, we're here to five, six o'clock at night. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't want you to be a rabbit, but you know, rabbits actually move fast. So maybe <laughs> we'll get more work out of you, I guess. Uh, this year we kicked off a, a self-care initiative, and so uh, in various campuses we have Zumba and we have some things going on for teachers after school where they all can come together, right? Because this is work family, right? We spend a lot of time together, and so when folks are engaged in these kind of activities where they're laughing and just being silly, it's important. It, it kind of fuels, uh, fuels the soul. So those are just a couple of things. Uh, one last thing that I try to do with my team that I'm still struggling with, but I said, you know what, I'm gonna be consistent is that there are just days you have to give people permission to leave early, and right? And so leaving early for a central office administrator means leaving at 
Like, that's not early, but right. in our world, 4.30, if someone walks out the door, you might get someone looking at you a little crazy, like, where are you going? Uh, and so even leaving at 4.30, people beat themselves up. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's a long day if you got there at 7, 7.30 in the morning, right? And so, on, uh, you know, I go around, is today your E-day, hmm. right? I, I'd like you to leave today, right? And so at first, you know, they looked at me a little crazy, and a few of them have started to kind of take me up on it, but we're not at a place where people feel comfortable at least one day, you know, one day a week. They leave around 4.30 and they can go have supper with their family or they can go to the gym. Uh, and so we're trying a few things and that's part of our self-care initiative. Thank you. Awesome. So I think I'm going to stay in the theme uh, about relationships and family. I think those things are really important. Um, we have, um, I have a pretty set schedule and I try to make that known so that people know where I am all the time. Um, but Mondays is our cabinet days where we, I meet with uh, system leaders. And uh, during those meetings though, I try to be really intentional about building, building those relationships. Um, so at the beginning of every one of those meetings, I'm always asking about other people's um, you know, experiences at home, family. I mean, I want them to share out what they are going through uh, because I think that's really important to um, no, like James was saying something earlier that resonated with me, and it was, uh, you know, people forget, and Maya Angelou said this, uh, you know, a long time ago, people forget what you say or do, but they never forget how you make them feel, right? And that's really important, um, that we spend time getting to know who people are, um, their real heart, what's, the, what's in that core, uh, because it's what's there that comes out all the time, whether you like it or not. I used to think when I was in grad school and we were talking about vision and mission, I just thought those were like trite kinds of things people would say, hyperbole, you know, uh, but the reality is what's in there is really what comes out all the time. And you have to have some time for introspection to really know who you are, right, and why you do what you do. And just having that time of reflection and introspection that you find that out through practice. And when you know who you are, it's easier to operate in your space, in yourself. And, and so for me, as a, one of the leaders, is getting to know other, other people's uh, core and what they believe, right? And so we spent a lot of time, in, not only in cabinet, but also outside. Uh, we, we bought a house in Ferguson last year, and so my, um, my wife has uh, spent like all this money decorating, and so I may have to get another job, <laughs> part-time part job. But at any rate, you know, our aim, though, is to have some time so that we can invite staff over, and, uh, and, and I don't say staff, I have friends and family over, and have conversations and just get, you know, to let our hair down, or in my case, well, you know what I mean. Um, but, you know, but, but spending time together is really important because when you know people and when you make a decision at work and uh, you may not agree with that decision uh, off the cuff, but you know who they are and why they do what they do, right? And that's really important. That's what relationships look like. It's easy to say, but how do you do it? Like, how do you spend time with others? And I think that's one of the barriers that uh, sort of uh, divides us when we don't spend that time getting to know who each other are, or is rather, so that we can work together as a team. And I always say, you know, if the work isn't done, if your work isn't done, my work isn't done. You know, I mean, we are together here. And so even our mantra is One District United, and it has to be the reality. Like, why do we do this work, and uh, who are you doing this work? Uh, because it's important for leaders to be learners, right? Like, you have to lead learning. Um, and so when we recruit and we get folks on board, so we're trying to build a pipeline, but until you can, you got to really think about, you know, what kind of people are going to be stepping into roles as principals and, and, and assistant superintendents, because they have to love people, they have to love themselves first and then love others and then work to that end, right? Because it's about children. You know, I'm here today because of great leaders, great educators who cared about my potential and not my situation. And, that, and that's important. And it's just not black and brown. It's all races, all creeds, all colors, all zips, right? Um, and so I think it's critical that we get to know who each, each other, uh, each person is, and, and, and spend that time deeply um, because you can lead that work. The other piece is, um, you know, mind, body, and soul. Um, so I think our bodies are really important because, you know, you can be a billionaire, but if you don't have your health, you don't have a whole lot, right? You, you need your health, and that's really important. Um, you know, and, you know, I've had, um, you know, a sister, um, my grandma, m many folks in my family who've died, uh, well, I've lost them to cancer and other ailments. Um, and, you know, there's a, uh, we, we have a crisis in this country around health. And I, and I actually am a lot smaller than I have been in years past because I love potato chips. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but I go to the gym personally in the morning. I get up at 4.30, um, and it's not, I don't see it as a task anymore. It's a part of my day. I get going. 
I work out in the mornings. Um, I'm, I'm running more, just really trying to stay active, getting this heart rate up so I can you know, be better at my work when I'm doing my work. And I, I try to push that to, to, my, to our team. Um, I even did um, Insanity for 38 days and, 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 and got like nice and felt, boy. And then I tell you what, I, the 39th day I had a meeting and I got off track and I haven't got been going yet. <laughs> but I, I really push that because that's really important. Um, because when you work with people and they know Joe, you know, and why I do what I do, it, it makes it so much easier. I, I believe this, and I'll, I'll pass it over to James, that if you take care of other people, they take care of you, right? Like if you take care of them and they know you're there for them, you don't ever have to worry. You know, when I went through what I went, th went through, uh, my board was absolutely amazing, uh, but I had board members telling me how the team was just rock solid at standing and supporting me all the way through. Now, if we didn't have those great relationships and they're genuine, I'm not fake, they're genuine, um, then I wouldn't have had the support I had when I was going through what I went through. And I, I believe that's because of the relationships we built earlier on. You take care of others and they absolutely will hands down take care of you because they know I will be there in the end. Somebody has a death in the family or somebody's sick, look, you don't need to come and, you know, I don't micromanage. Take care of yourself, take care of home because if you take care of home, when you come here, you'll be ready to do the work. And they know that's how I operate. Um, so, yeah. So, thank you, Joe. So, I'd love to lean in a little bit into a conversation around gender equity and leadership, right? So, in the spirit of real talk, we all know that 75% of women make up the teaching workforce in the K to 12 space. Yet, less than 15% of them across the 14,000 districts in this country are at the chief executive level. Um, snapshot here at this panel, right? So my question is, to, uh, starting with James, is what are you doing in your, resp in your position of leadership to ensure that we are, you, we are not perpetuating the cycle of inequality in systems and elevating uh, women in your district. So when I, um, when Carlos shared this question with me a few days ago, I, I thought I, I better jot down a few notes here to make sure I, I touch on the things I want to say. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll refer to my notes a little bit. But uh, the first thing I want to say is I think there are really two approaches to influencing change, and uh, they are either transformation or reformation. And there's a huge difference in approaching something as a, a reform or really trying to transform something. And uh, on a side note, I'll say that one of the reasons we're probably still doing education the same way for the most part that it was done 100 years ago is because the approach has been a reform approach instead of a transform approach. And uh, so I'm working hard to be transformational in my leadership and do less reformation work. At the same time, in this area, uh, I think I would probably have to admit that the work I've led has probably been uh, more reformational. So I'm going to give you an example of a few things that, that I've been involved in. Uh, one is that the Kentucky Association of School Superintendents created, um, uh, created a minority superintendent intern program several years ago. And uh, so the, the, the focus was um, certainly people uh, of color being in that, but also uh, females of color. And so um, I looked for the opportunity to host an intern superintendent in my district and did so for a year. And so now my role actively with her, that was a uh, year before last, or last year, excuse me, last year. And so my role now is uh, to be her mentor and to be her number one go-to for, uh, for references as she's looking across the nation for the right fit for her to move into a superintendency. Right now she's in a top tier uh, leadership role in a large district in Kentucky, but, but wants to be a superintendent. So I've built that relationship and I'm working with her. So those are one-on-one -on -one opportunities we need to look for. Another thing in our district that I was, was able to do, and it's just a small thing, um, but it's been a difference maker. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to, um, to encourage several leaders to move towards superintendent credentialing. And in, in most states, 
there's no perk in that in a salary structure. So uh, what I was able to do was make a, and we talked earlier about policy things that make a big difference. So put in the salary scale for my central office administrators who had superintendent credentialing to have a, a slight increment bump. So it's about $3,000 a year, it's not a lot of money. But uh, uh, I, I invited a cohort and I handpicked them, uh, all, all female leaders from within the district uh, to, uh, to get involved in a superintendent cohort and gave them the release time uh, to, be a, to be a part of that. So the long story short is uh, we had six uh, female administrators in the district uh, take, take us up on that opportunity. And um, so now um, uh, as opportunities come, they already have their credential, they're ready to go. And that perk of that $3,000 a year for most of them was the impetus to say, okay, I'm willing to go back to school and spend a little money on that because I know I'm gonna get to make some of that back. And uh, at this point, uh, one of those is serving as an interim chief operations officer in our district uh, because of being able to have that credential because of that bump a few years ago, we, we nudged her to, to do that. So that's the, those are the little things, but I think it's, um, uh, I think it's, it is a reform issue. It's not, I don't know how we could look at it exactly as a transformation issue. We have to keep nudging through a reform sort of, sort of structure, look for creative ideas. Great. Thank you. Joe, would you like to answer? So, um, you know, gender equality, I think is really important, but I can tell you this, uh, quality is job one in everything. You want high quality people first, right? Um, but the second part is I'm always thinking about who is in that role. So when I got to Ferguson, um, you know, we have 25 schools there. We have zero black male principals, zero. And the kids who have having the biggest challenges are black males, but they don't see any black men in the principalship. I mean, what sense does that make to me? I don't want just someone just because they're a black man. I want you to have quality and can do the work, right? We have five now, um, two at the high school level, um, two at the elementary and two and one rather at the, at the middle school. Uh, the, the leadership team at the central level, assistant superintendents, um, I'll make this statement publicly and I, I, I feel um, a little bit of pressure maybe on the inside to not say it, but I will. I think women are smarter than men. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, I'm sorry guys. Um, and, 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 I, and I probably didn't believe that uh, until I got into the throes of the work and see who you know, gets deep into the work when it comes to leading. Uh, you know, uh, of the assistant superintendents in our district, um, you know, most of the 60% of the 65% are women. Their salaries are equal to the men's salaries. I mean, you, uh, we have uh, African American females, white females, white males, uh, African American, I mean, uh, 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 biracial. It, I, we are intentional around making sure that we have representation at every level uh, because children need to see people who look like them uh, in successful roles. And we have to, when we talk about issues of race, we gotta call it out. And let's have thoughtful conversations about race, uh, thoughtful conversations about uh, class and, and et cetera, all these other uh, ologies, if you will. But I think it's really important um, for us to have these conversations and to identify people who are of quality, who can step into the role and get the work done. So we're also building a pipeline. How do we, so what are the skill sets that we need to have in principals and, and system leaders who know what to look for when they go in classrooms so that they come with the skill sets that when they get into the role, they can step into uh, doing the work in the classroom. So we're re really intentional uh, at, the, at the district level um, and also at the school leadership level, not just with the principal APs. Uh, we have a position called ISLs, and that's instructional support leaders. So those are teachers who don't want to necessarily be administrators in the sense of an AP or a principal, but want to lead others in learning. And so we have an ISL role that I stole that idea from Chicago Public Schools. So just really being intentional about that. But I think quality is, is, is job one. Great. Bobby, would you like to comment? Um, I, I would say, uh, in, I agree with you in terms of like being intentional, being explicit. You know, it's something that, we look at, we look at race, we look at the gender of our leaders at all different levels. And then I think in the, throughout the years that we've grown our um, small network, um, we've, you know, there's a, a mom who just kept coming, coming, volunteering, volunteering, and suddenly we realized, you know, this person belongs on the staff. So it's about growing people, you know, it's about growing folks from within. And so now we have a teaching fellows program, you know, and we have, you know, 10, 12 folks each year. And, and many of those folks are parents at our school 
who want to move forward and who want to become teachers or want to become leaders. And so it's about growing your folks. And then I would also say um, it's also about having every person in your organization know that you're committed to their own personal growth as well so that when we have a secretary who's trying to get her degree we will cover her for her so she can get take those classes or that she needs to study and so it's being the kind of organization that allows folks to keep moving forward and really supports that in practical and real ways awesome thank you um, I, I know we're, 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 running, we're running in time, and, but, and I want to make sure that we get to some questions from our incredible principal body that is here. So I, I want to ask one last question and maybe ask everyone to be as concise and direct as possible on this one so we have some time for Q&A. And it's the question of around student-centered and student-led learning, right? So each of you in your respective works have demonstrated a commitment to this type of learning in one way or another. Um, would love to hear from each of you, what do you believe all graduates should know and be able to do when they leave your schools? I'll throw that out to Roberto first. Yeah, I appreciate the question. Uh, quite honestly, you know, I wouldn't enjoy this work if you know, myself personally and then the people I work around didn't put students at the core. Uh, and so for me, it's about soft skills. You know, it's not who does, you know, how they perform on a, on a Regents exam or um, what, great, what their GPA is. It, it's not any of those things. It's really around can you think independently? Can you work um, and solve problems with other people? Uh, are you compassionate? Do you consider other uh, perspectives? Not that you have to agree with people, uh, but can you at least allow yourself to consider someone else's perspective that is different than yours? Thank you. James. So for us, uh, we made a conscious decision about two years ago that we were gonna create a profile of a graduate and uh, we would first create what our community wanted and uh, we spent about a year creating that work. The interesting thing was when you go through it and look at those things in the profile, they're all things that are really hard to measure, but they're all things that we want for our kids. And uh, you really don't see much about test scores. You don't see it at all. You see uh, character things. You see employability things. You see honesty and integrity. So for us, um, we're, we put those things in, those things we want to see in, in what we call a profile of a graduate. And uh, we're getting a lot of positive response in that work. Um, and I, I would say this, I want to leave you with this thought. I, I don't know how many of you watched the Vietnam series that was on just uh, this fall, uh, those series of uh, documentary uh, pieces on Vietnam. Um, the, the one quote that I thought stuck out the most was General Westmoreland measured success in Vietnam by body count. And so they talked to one of his advisors years later for this documentary, and, and he's, he's well up in years at this point, and they asked him about that strategy. And he said, well, you know, all other wars had been measured through uh, taking of property, taking of land, and we couldn't do that in Vietnam. So we decided the only thing we could measure was body count. And um, so he said this, and I, I wrote it down as a powerful statement to direct our work when we think about test scores and, and measuring success that way as opposed to a profile of a graduate. He said, he said, when you can't measure what is important, you make what you can measure important. And that really drives my thinking these days about making sure we learn to measure and report to our community the things in our profile of a graduate, things to do with character and, uh, and the ability to solve problems and be productive citizens. So um, we don't have that, the, all the answers to that, but my, my suggestion and encouragement to you is to create a profile of a graduate, involve your whole community in, in creating that, and then worry about how you're going to measure it afterwards. Figure out what you want first. Thank you. 
Um, when we created our um, high school, we used this question to design it. You know, what would it take for every student to be known, loved, and inspired? And, you know, in answer to that, we designed a school that we thought would help, you know, get us there. And part of what's interesting about that is its experiences. You know, it's a journey of learning, of being together, of friendships, of screwing it up and then trying it again, you know. And so I want, um, we want our graduates to have gone through that experience together and to, to feel known and to feel love and to feel inspired to live their own lives, you know. We, we graduate them in advisories, you know, they graduate by advisory. And, um, and then, you know, they've had an experience and they have a network. They have possibilities in their lives that they didn't have before. And we want folks with that feeling deep inside of them of people who can make a difference in the world, you know. And um, I think I love the part that's hard to measure. That's the best part, you know, it really is. And, um, you know, in the mission statement, we have words like deeply enlivened on purpose, you know, because you can't measure that. Good, go for the gold. I don't want to go for what you can easily measure, though that is important. That's not what's driving us, you know. And so um, when we get to graduation, it's long and everybody's crying and everyone's talking about love, you know. It's a great Saturday morning. And the teachers who are in relationship with those kids are there crying and going through it with them, you know, and our school leaders are there crying and going through it with them because it's a threshold for our kids. And if we've done our job right, the kids know it's a threshold for them. And they're seeing themselves stepping into that next part where they get to keep going. You know, I, I speak to the freshmen every year and I say, um, when they get to our school, because it, it looks different, it feels different, I say, guys, guess what? You already deserve this. You're not supposed to have to earn a nice place to be and meaningful relationships and important work to do. You already deserve it. Your job now is to practice, to just get good at it, get used to it, because this is how it's going to be from here on out. So at graduation, I want, we want the kids to have experienced that and to take that with them. Awesome, awesome. Uh, yeah, um, you know, problem solving, um, you know, compassion. Um, you know, all those soft and hard skills that we know are important for children to have, I think are, are really important. But I, I really want uh, children to know who they are, and then I want them to do me or do you, right? In, in a word, identity. Like, I think there's some strong identity work that has to happen for every child, figuring out who I am and where I belong. And I think that's a skill that when they get to that place and can leave high school and going into the world with that skill set, they can define and chart their path and become unstoppable. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay, with that, we turn it over to you all for your questions. And I know that we're, um, we're, we're crunched on time, but I feel like this is a very important part of this conversation. So we'll start off with taking maybe three questions, and then we'll see how we do, and then we'll go from there. So, uh, see, Chris, we're going to start with uh, Carrie. Good morning. Um, my name is Carrie Duff. I'm the principal of the Lemister Center for Excellence. We're a small town, 45,000 folks. We have um, 6,000 kids in our district, and I've got 56 kids in my building that I love. Um, in the spirit of real talk, you guys are doing amazing work, right? You're very successful superintendents. The superintendency is an impossible job. And I think it's impossible because we haven't talked about a whole group of people who are your bosses, right? Your school committees, your boards. We talked about them. No, you, yeah, well, well, I want to talk about them because my school is, is held hostage by your bosses, right? And there are a whole bunch of people in this room that I've talked to over the past couple days, and we're all, you know, we're on the ground, we're doing the work, we're doing what's right. You're telling us that what we're doing is right, but there's this, this cloud, this, um, you know, these folks who get reelected every two years or don't get reelected or switch over and, and it's political and it's, they don't get it, <laughs> right? They don't get the work, they don't get the, the pace at, and the intentionality of the work. They're not patient. Um, how do we fix that? Where do, what do we do with that? Thank you. Who would like to take that? So I'd, I'd like to just respond a little bit to that. Um, I'm reading a book now by Todd Whitaker. You, we all know who Todd is and how encouraging he is. And the name of the book is The Hero Maker. 
and it is about that very thing. And, and I, I will tell you this, I'm, I'm still learning this, but in my 10th year as a superintendent, every person who comes on the board uh, wants to be a hero. That's part of why they run for public office and get elected. Now, the thing they, might, they think might make them a hero is not necessarily the thing that I might think might make them a hero. But if I can make them a hero in some other way, um, then, then I can shift that agenda. So I'm really working hard on, on that thing that everybody wants and you can't turn it off. Everybody wants to matter. All our kids want to matter. Our board members want to matter. So if I can help them matter and shape that into a way and make them a hero in another way, uh, then we can move forward with, uh, with the leadership agenda that, that I, I believe is the appropriate course for the district. So that idea of making heroes is, is the seed I'd like to plant. Can I add one other part? I mean, go ahead and have some chutzpah too, which I'm sure you probably already do, right? Mm -hmm. Do what's right for kids and everyone will have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Uh, use one. So hearing you say you're in your 10th year and you're still figuring it out, uh, <laughs> I think speaks to the challenge, right? And so, uh, I don't think anyone has truly figured it out, and that's why it's so complex. It's hyper-political, folks have agendas. Uh, and I think for me, in my fourth year, still trying to figure it out, uh, is trying to be very clear about roles and responsibilities. Because I think that's another layer to the work that makes it more complex, is that, you know, why does someone run? What's their particular agenda? Uh, are they really here for kids? Or are they perpetuating something that's anti-student? Uh, which sadly sometimes is the case, right? And so I think for me, the, the way I've always approached this work from day one is I'm gonna focus on the work and let everything else just happen. Um, and, and I don't mean that to sound simple because it's not, but if I now, part of my job, I do have to pay attention to the political nature of what's happening. So I don't mean disregard it. I just mean I'm not going to spend and put all my energy in that space because then I'm not, I'm not focused on students. I'm not focused on outcomes. I'm not focused on impact. And those three words I use consistently with our leaders, right? Because I feel like that's where I can make the biggest difference. I'm not there to be the mayor. While I understand that part of the role entails me to, you know, be in that arena, and I can, I can play in that arena, but my focus is to ensure that this district moves forward. And, and I, you know, honestly, it's not easy. It's, it's the work that keeps us up at night. And so we've, uh, you know, we've introduced language like, let's stay in our lanes, right? Because there are things that the CEO of the organization is responsible for and things that I'm not responsible for, right? And so when we make those lanes really clear and then help people to reinforce the lanes, the work becomes not easier, but maybe a little bit easier. Yeah, qu just quickly, um, you know, so here's the thing. We, you know, you're going to have school boards. You're going to have uh, groups for accountability reasons, right? And the last thing we need to try to do is to try to change them. You can't do that. Don't, 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 I mean, what can you do to change you? And what can you do to help move the situation forward, right? Like I'm in my second uh, superintendency rodeo, if you will. Uh, this is my sixth year in the, in the, in the seat, if you will. And, and so what I have learned is that they are in charge. And, and, I, and I make that clear. Uh, but I also make it clear about who I am and where I, you know, what I believe. And so when I interviewed for Ferguson, when I applied for Ferguson and interviewed, you know, I was very clear about, you know, this is how I operate. Uh, I'm about children, uh, period. And, you know, we have, we have an election every year. So I have the potential to get uh, at least two in this coming year. I think it's, no, it's next year, three. So I have seven members on my board. Every year we have elections in April. So I can get new school board members every year, right? And so, yeah, I, you know, they are in charge, but I always try to be clear about where I'm going and where that fits because we can't change that body. But what you do is educate them and build the relationships. You know, you got to have those relationships because if you have great relationships with anybody, you can get the work done. Great. Thank you. Chris, there we go. Question. Ready? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
Sun Regional Director, Big Picture Learning. So quick question for all my superintendents on the panel. Uh, in your role as superintendent, um, what's the biggest lesson you learned in your role? Children are first. I mean, that's trite, but y'all, it is true, right? And we have to figure out how to message that. Like, this work is about children. It's about this little black boy who grew up poor in the South and had all these challenges, but all kinds of teachers decided to educate him well, right? That's what it's about. And I think we have to always have a clarity about that story and how we message that story. That children are first. It sounds, but it's so critically important. And we have all these political forces often that get in the way of that. So, I may have learned this before I was superintendent, but it, it overshadows everything I do. Every time I have conversations with kids, when I spend an hour in the cafeteria talking to kids, um, what I always remember is they're going to grow up to be adults. And I'm a pretty big guy, but early on in my teaching uh, career, I was at the mall Christmas shopping, and I heard this, vote, this voice really deep, way deeper than mine, said, hey, Mr. Nyhoff, and I turned around and I looked at somebody in the chest. And I don't do that very often, like Carlos. He's b big as Carlos. And I, I looked up at him, and he had a full beard, and, and I just kind of recognized something about the eyes, and I called him by his name and, and kind of in question. And he said, I said, is, is that you? And he said, right, right, it's me. And, and the first words out of my mouth were these, I hope I was always nice to you. <laughs> And that has really guided my work through the years. And, and I would say that's the biggest thing I've learned, not, not just in the superintendency, but all through life, is be nice to people. You're going you're gonna to run into them again. <laughs> so I think two quick things. One, uh, I've learned that people are afraid to take risk. I think we live in a world of high stakes and accountability. And so what I love about the Big Picture Network, it's all about how to be non-traditional and get fast away from the status quo. And so I just think that uh, failing is not accepted in our culture and education. And so you see people kind of guarded. They're not really willing to try new things for the fear of not being good at it right away. But we all know that we learn the most in that, in that period of time when we're failing and learning and stretching. And so I would say from a systems level, how do you get layers in your system to understand innovation, understand how to take risk, uh, so that way people are more willing to try new practices and not hold on to things that probably don't work, but they're used to doing it, and so they'll just perpetuate it. So I think that's one quick thing. and then. In, in the spirit of this overemphasis on standards and assessments, we don't talk enough about love in our schools, mm -hmm. right? The same way we don't talk about work-life balance, I don't think we talk enough about love, very um, explicitly, right? And so in Newburgh this year, our mantra is do it with love, right? And so that's an effort to help our systems leader, help our building leaders to really talk about that. Right? We, want, we see bullying escalating and, and people taking their lives. Why? Our kids are hurting. We have adults who are hurting. And so if we, if we come to this building, we come to this place every single day, and the primary focus is on, so how are we aligning the standards today, and how can we get better results on assessments, which I understand that's how you know, districts are are graded and held accountable, okay, we get that part of it, but when do we inject love into the equation? And I, I don't think we do at all, right? There are a few places, few anomalies where people are doing this really, really well, and people are happy, and, and they feel safe, and they feel comfortable, but that's not the norm. And so that's another area of learning that I felt over the summer, you know what, this, we, have to, we have to take a turn here Right? We're still going to stay focused, but part of the focus now is, is actually talking about love and how people treat each other and how welcome they feel and how safe they feel. 
Um, I I think yeah I wanted to do that too. I think in the um, in the uh, more of the personal way, I think one of the things that I I learned was about ownership. You know, a school when it's alive is a socially constructed organization, right? And and because I had the experience of, you know my role at the beginning was to hold up the torch strong and say nothing's stopping us till we get this school open and you know we're taking a stand for this and I had to do that and do that and do that and at a certain point I realized it it didn't matter anymore if I was the one saying that if the the teachers needed to just as passionately be holding that and the kids needed to just as passionately be holding that and that meant that um, I had to um, relax a little bit, <laughs> you know, relax. And then I really realized the power of so everyone in ownership of the mission and vision, in ownership of the school. And, and teachers have a lot of, they are the heart of the school when they're arguing passionately about curriculum and they're deciding how, what is the right schedule that's humane for people, which is something we definitely aren't, haven't figured out yet. Um, but. But to actually have a school be alive means, and it's, it's interesting to be in a position of authority and have a role when you have that commitment in a grassroots way to so many people owning the school. But it is the way that a school really is alive and one that we're committed to and it translates to everything and to the children's experience in the classroom and to the teacher's experience and then everyone else. And so. I think as someone who um, was there from the beginning, you know, it's probably a little bit of founder syndrome or whatever you want to call it, but, um, but it also translated into, um, into how a school continues to grow and evolve and still be at the cutting edge of imagination. You know, where do we go from here? A lot of people should be asking that question together and creating the answers together. And that was something that I didn't know about when we first started. Our final question would go to. One of the schools that's being celebrated went from 8% to 14% proficient. And that's being touted as a success, right? So, so my thinking is, man, thousands of kids took this test. And the narrative of, that the adults are giving are saying that you guys are not proficient, right? So you have thousands of kids who feel like failure, right? and who are being measured against this impossible metric, right? So now it's 14% this year. What will it be next year? 18 and the year after that, 20? So how many years to get to 100? And is that the point, right? So my question to you is, how do you inject hope within your own districts for kids who feel like failure and are being, li are being labeled as sort of deficits who don't have anything to contribute. What's your response to like making those kids feel hope and valued and treasured and like they have passions and they're intelligent? So, awesome question. Um, you said it was a real one, right? So <laughs> you were right. Um, and I don't know if I have the, the answer, but you know, as you were asking it, it made me think of, so I wouldn't, want the narrative to be you're proficient because you've shown, you know, yes, it's growth, but 14%, we know that's, that's, telling, that's a horrible story, right? But you want to recognize the work that the staff and students are engaged in that, that made that growth. So where are some other success points that you can celebrate along the way? So for me, it's always about quick wins. Right? And so if we don't celebrate along the way, if we don't acknowledge along the way, you know, I think that's a problem in the culture. Right? And so if I'm going to instill hope, I think the strategy is really around what is, what's the formative work every day and every week that's taking place in the building that's transforming the culture and building new work habits and getting students to believe 
that they always have had it in them to succeed? And how do you get the other, you know, how do you get the adults in the school to recognize that potential as, you know, we heard? So for me, that's the story. That's the approach is to not focus on the fact that they're 14 percent proficient, but what's taking place day to day, week by week. I just, you know, it's so frustrating sometimes in the public school system. It, it's designed, you know, and it's not, it's designed a certain way. And I've had the opportunity to design something else with a lot of great people. But it is set up to have kids getting just the small portion of what a real education is. It's so narrow. A lot of kids still aren't getting art and music and recess, right? So yeah, they feel like failures. They're asked to do something and it's not even, they're not even doing that. I mean, you guys know better than anyone what it takes. Start with the kids' interests. <laughs> you know, start with what they do care about and build out from there. And there is no reason the public schools can't be doing that as well. The problem is, you know, I mean, I heard Jeffrey Canada speak once and I loved one of the things he said. He was like, let's look at what the rich folks are doing and we'll do that. You know, if it's good enough for their kids, it's good enough for our kids. We're, we're underestimating the kids from the moment they walk in the door. And, you know, part of that is, for example, we're saying, you know, early childhood is really important. Let's get pre-K. Let's get a three-year-old class, which is great. But it's not great if then we're teaching first grade cu curriculum to three and four-year-olds, right? Because that's not what they need developmentally. And it's out of fear, I think that we are afraid of leaving folks behind. We're afraid of the gap. And so we're under pressure. But, but it has to be, our schools have to be designed based on who our kids are. And if that means there, and many of the kids in Baltimore and in our schools, they have faced trauma, they have stress and trauma in their lives, then let's hit that head on. And they should be aware of that themselves and how that impacts them. You know, but that doesn't, take away from what their capacity for living a, a real life is and for succeeding. And I think we need to take a stand on that as a district and for our teachers and for our families. They need to be educated for that. And, and I absolutely believe it's possible that we can have a thriving school system and every single school be great for kids. That would be real choice instead of, you know, chance. Right, so I know that we can do it, but it's how you see kids in the first place that's underneath all of that. Sure. So um, just quickly, um, I, th you know, so I think you know how we measure students. I think is a problem itself, like accountability systems, and I think there's some policy work that has to be done for, at the state levels uh, to redefine what success looks like. I think that's important. One, but two, um, I think it goes to what Bobby was saying, and many of, much of what I've heard today is um, you know, we, we really have to think about what success looks like for that child. Personalized learning, I think, is really, really important. Um, and so we, it's like the healthcare system. We don't you know, go to the hospital and expect everybody to get the same treatment depending on what your needs are. And so we do this, but, but we do that in education. So I think we have to do some things different there. Uh, but I can tell you for us in Ferguson, we are headed, headed down a road where uh, we're doing a master plan that's gonna redesign the way we've been doing business, right? Um, Switch is a good book that helps to help people engage in the change process. But I think that, you know, I think you nailed it when you said uh, early childhood and child development, right? So our district puts, we put about two and a half million dollars of our local dollars in early education because so many of our students come, especially our black and brown students are coming without that early experience. So they haven't found their voices and know how to build community and know how to play and learn at the same time. So we think that's really, really important to lay a strong foundation so that they have a stronger future. So many kids, I didn't have early ed uh, opportunities. My grandma was my early ed, right? And she just thankfully she gave me some great you know, tools. But so many children come, we have kids in third and fourth grade who are melting down like nobody's business. And they're just, they're losing it. I mean, like a conniption on a daily basis. And, and so we got to figure out why. Uh, so I think we can foundationally approach it from that perspective. But I think, uh, you know, meeting kids where they are when they come to us, we got to personalize learning so we figure out what are their social and emotional needs and meet those needs. It's, it's Maslow's work. You know, what are, what are my basic needs? And if I'm having issues at home, you can't expect me to learn math. You gotta figure out what, you know, what, my, what my support looks like. And so I think we have to do more social emotional work in our schools to meet children where they are. 
but also hold the standard up. We gotta, kids gotta know how to, they gotta have the tools, right? Like they can't graduate and not have the strong tools they need because you can't solve a problem if you don't have the foundational skills. So they, those things are important. I think it's how we approach that, uh, that that's key. I would say that I wanna echo that theme of personalization. One of the things that um, really rings true with us with, with our gap uh, areas is that uh, th there's this big difference, big disconnect between a dream and an aspiration and kids who are really struggling and really far behind and have never experienced proficiency, their dreams are just as big as, as the kids in our district that, uh, that have been proficient or distinguished in the, in the scores. But, but understanding how to turn that dream into an aspiration, to create a to-do list and be working on that to-do list, uh, that's, that's where personalization comes in. And for us, that's our big challenge is to, is to personalize that piece. And, and then the, the other thing that goes with it goes back to measurement. Uh, the, whole, the whole issue of what's being measured there, uh, we, we've taken responsibility for that. So when, when what is heard and seen is just a, test, a state test score and we're not showing clear evidence of students' progression towards achieving the profile of a graduate, which is what our community has told us they want. They didn't ask us for a test score. They asked for success in the profile. So it's up to us as school leaders to paint a different picture by saying this is how you measure success in the profile and, uh, and ensure that, that our community um, gets what they ask for. So uh, for us, I, you know, I, I hate it when, and this year we had a, a drop in state test scores, and I hated that. And, and, you know, I'm embarrassed by that in some ways. But on the other side of the coin, that's not really what the community is asking us for. They're asking us for these character pieces, these skill pieces, these uh, capacities to be successful adults. And I've got to really work on how to measure those and report those to them. And then I think when I do, they'll see those uh, test scores as being a secondary piece. I can't speak to Baltimore in particular. Um, maybe that's where I need to go uh, go join in the work because I know those challenges are tough there too. Um, but I think these challenges are, are nationwide. They're everywhere. Cool. Um, really appreciative of this conversation and the time and honesty that you all brought to this conversation. We are sadly out of time, but know that fortunately you are all here with us for the duration of the conference and encourage um, colleagues, principals to reach out and to have individual conversations with, with our panelists. Um, full transparency, questions around bullying and um, social media hit the cutting room floor in this conversation. We didn't get to those. Pieces around how they as influencers with their colleagues hit the cutting room floor to ensure that we're not always pushing up, but they're also allies in expanding this work nationally and beyond. So really encourage everyone that's here, if something that you, a question, a thought, a wondering, at some point to please um, reach out to our friends here, and then also simultaneously invite you all to have conversations with our colleagues in the work that they're doing across the country, which is inspiring and really powerful. Um, how about a nice round of applause for us?